authority of Christ. We're still in the book of Hebrews as God has been showing us this transition and change that he's made for the final chapter of our time here on earth. For the final chapter for our time here on earth. Praise God. As I said, we're still in the book of Hebrews as God, as God is showing us the change that he's making for this last chapter while we're here on earth as we are preparing for his return and establishing things as he created it to be from the beginning. One problem with this process is that as human beings, we hate change. We like getting comfortable and getting right. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> we'll get there shortly. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but you know, a change has come. And the reason we must understand that life with God is nothing but change because of the fall. Uh, really understanding what it really takes to get back to where we fell from. Uh, it, it's kind of likened to some relationships sometimes. You know, you're in, you're in what you call tight relationships or, or strong relationships, and someone breaks the trust in that relationship on a severe level. And a lot of times, it's hard for that relationship to ever get back to where it was before. No matter how much you try and how much things you do, uh, it just doesn't seem to be able to get back to that level again. Uh, it takes a lot of work, a lot of dying and a lot of forgetting. But not only just dying and forgetting, but becoming, changing to a place that you're no longer the same as we're moving close if the love is strong enough. And as God has taken us through the book of Hebrews, he's revealing just how strong his love is for us as he has brought in a remedy to restore the broken relationship. And that's what we must understand as children and servants of God this life is about restoring that relationship. It's not about all the stuff or the things that you can get. Those are just like some of the trinkets that come along with any relationship. Any relationship that's based on the stuff and the things, it's not really a strong relationship. Because when the stuff and the things stop coming, it impacts the relationship. And so when Satan and his scheming Program the human mind to focus on the stuff and the things rather than the relationships. He's programmed the human mind to sacrifice relationships for the stuff and the things. When it's supposed to be the very opposite, where we will sacrifice stuff and things for the relationship. We will take a direct approach and effort in restoring the relationship with active behavior, active change, active way of thinking, which requires you to change. And because we're created in the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's not so much about changing who you are, it's about becoming who God created you to be. Spirit in his image and likeness that is characterized by love, unconditional love, which requires no change, but inspires change. Because regardless of what has happened to you in life, true love will change your state of mind if you are interested in change. But unfortunately, a lot of times, because of the human nature and our failure to have been broken free to take control of our hearts and our minds, our soul that has been programmed in the things of the world is in charge. 
and it dictates to uh, the things that we deal with, how we deal with it. And because you've been a prisoner to that, uh, all you can do is sit back and watch because you have no power to step in to take over. But thanks to the change that God has brought about, we have power to come out. We have power to change if we've really changed. If we've truly been born again. We're in Hebrews chapter 10, and today we'll be coming from verses 26 through 39. Uh, as we ended up last week, you know, uh, I think it's a good message to kind of reiterate, especially at a time like this. God told us in the last verse, don't forsake our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, you have to understand that we're in a time where this is being thrown to the wayside because of fear, because of lack of power and authority. And this thing that God has used to get his people's attention, to bring them into line with him and to shake them, the enemy is using it as an opportunity to keep us separated. You add on the meta world. You add on the coronavirus. You, you add on all the violence and hatred that's going on in our world. It sets the perfect backdrop for staying to yourself, not wanting to be bothered with anyone. And all you need is a good reason. Uh, though there are those that have found that being at home, some churches have found that I can still get the money. And I don't have to go in. We don't have to spend any money. What return is that that we can get all that money still coming in, but we don't have to do a thing to get it. Some people are deciding, you know what, this might be the better way to go. But that's not from God. That's from the enemy. But God is just an awesome God. Everything that God does helps reveal who his true children are. Keep that in mind. He said that must, all this stuff must happen. All this stuff must go on because in it you're going to discover who the true child of God is. So he says, part of my plan is you have to come together to encourage one another, to look each other in the eye, to look each other in the face, uh, to recognize, to see if something's going on with your brother and sister, to see whether there's something on their mind that they may need help with or they just may need to talk. So it needs someone to listen. Because when you're all alone, Satan sets the host to listen to you. Not only listen to you, but give you counsel. And when he gets you in that state, it's hard to hear from God if you have not been committed to being who God created you to be, which is spirit, created in his image and likeness. So we start off today in verse 26 saying, For we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. How much of your punishment do you think you will deserve who have trampled on the foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings partly by being made a public spectacle through the reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and, ex and act accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance 
so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith in the persevering of the soul, preserving of the soul. Let the church say amen. amen. As we look at verses 26 through 31, God says, look, if you, if you deliberately keep on sinning after you have come to the knowledge of the truth, he says there is no longer a sacrifice for your sins. Let that meditate, Nate, Nate, for a minute. If you have professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you profess to be a child of God, and you have been taught the word of God concerning the life that God wants you to live. He said, now, once you have received that knowledge and you willfully continue to sin, there's no more sacrifice for those sins that you are committing. Let that marinate. This is God talking to us. Because we live in a society where people wink at sin because God used to wink at it a long time ago. God winked for a reason. Because he had a plan. That he could take care of those that he was winking over. Unfortunately, that plan, that part has ended. He said, now, if you willfully, willfully, that means you know that what you're about to do, say, think, or believe is wrong. And you profess to be a child of God. If you consciously, willfully sin when you know it's wrong, God says, you got to wear that. You got to wear that. That's going to cost you. Let that marinate, because God don't play. We know that by now, don't we? If he says it, he means it. If you go out there and get one ticket for speed, you will never drive again in this house. Who wants to take that chance? Especially if you've been walking and you've started to ride. Life is different. Walking is not your favorite option now. Walking means I'm stranded. I'm, I'm confined. I can't move about freely as I used to. God said, if you deliberately continue to sin when you know the truth, there's no more sin. There's nothing to cover that sin. God says, because you do that, I'm going to take revenge on you. I'm going to take revenge against you. Because I'm going to pay you back. <laughs> I don't know if people say that or not, but you said that a lot when we were young. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to get you. Just watch and see. You think you can get away with that? You are highly mistaken. And you get on a mission plotting. How and when? Because you want it to be remembered. God said, look, if you're doing that, I'm going to get my revenge. And what we need to know, God is getting some revenge right now. Because people that call upon his name have been willfully sinning even when they've been sinned with the truth. He said, don't worry about it. I got it. I'm going to take care of that. He said, I'm going to get revenge on you. I'm going to pay you back. The Lord said, and I'm going to judge my people in case you're thinking about the world. I'm talking about those that say they're my people. I'm going to pay you back. And he says, you know what? It's a terrible thing to fall into my hands when I'm angry. You ain't seen bad until you fall into the hands of an angry God. And look at all the things that we've seen in this world that Satan is doing and, 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 and his anger, and we think it's so terrible. God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. Mess with me if you want to, because I paid a high price for you. You didn't come cheap, and I'm going to hold you accountable. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He said, I paid a high price for you. I paid the ultimate for you. And if you think that you're going to willfully sin after I have given you the truth and empowered you to follow it, 
You are sadly mistaken. I'm going to get you. In my own free time. Ain't nothing like waiting on a whipping, is it? Especially when you know they don't play when you've taken it that far. You try to sleep it off. You get, you get instant uh, depression. You want to just sleep. <laughs> but if you grew up in a family like mine, the one thing you wanted to do was stay woke. Because they'll come and get you in your sleep. You wake up, think you're having a nightmare. And once you wake up, you wish it was. Because they're not holding nothing back. See, why would God do such a thing? See, God takes sinning personally. God takes sinning personally. God hates sin because it opposes his very nature and his work. And it's the work of the, nature, of the devil. God takes sin personally, people. He said, I'm going to get you if you know the truth and you willfully disobeying me. It's personal to God. It's an assault on God and who he is. God describes sin as wounds and bruises, as a burden, as something that defiles, a heavy debt, a stain and darkness. God created the world and called it good, you have to understand. When he created the world, he said it was good. When he created the man, he said it was real good. But soon you know the story, however, Adam and Eve sin, bringing judgment upon themselves and the world. Sin disrupted Adam and Eve's fellowship with God and their relationship with each other as well as their relationship with creation. Sin is a perversion of the good God created. God created you good, very good. And to be stained by sin is an approach to God, a reproach to God. He takes it personally because you're sinning against him because you're created in his image and his likeness. God hates sin because it brings death and separation, whereas he longs to bring us life. God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever, he wasn't being picky, whosoever would choose to believe in him, he'd give you life. The life that he intended for you to have at the beginning. The life which sin damaged. He takes it very personally, and he lets you know up front, I'm going to take revenge on those who profess to be my children, know the truth, and still don't do it. You are directly sinning against God. So don't get concerned when people talk to you about your sin. Be reminded that they're talking to you on God's behalf, because God said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of them. And he says, it's going to be a terrible time. When I come to collect, it's going to be a terrible time. See, God longs to remove our sin and restore us to right relationships with him. He wants to restore the relationship that he so longed to have that was broken through sin. You ever had a friend or someone you were really close to? And somebody came between y'all and broke that relationship. Makes you feel a little something kind of way, don't it? You don't look at that personal individual or whatever that came between you all. I hear people say it all the time. Such and such became between us. We had a good thing going on. Then such and such came in and, and broke up our friendship. I mean, it's kind of rough when you have something that you cherish and some outside force comes and destroys it. As I was studying in compellingtruth.org, it helped me out in putting this, that thought that I just shared with you together. God takes sin personally. 
He said, I got it. I'm going to take revenge. He don't want nobody else to step in. I don't want you fighting on my, half, on my behalf. Nobody can handle this like I want it handled. I'm going to take care of, of it myself. So if you want to live the quality of life that God intends for you to have by being his child, you must establish an intimate relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's about relationships, people, not accomplishments, not possessions. It's about relationships, relationships that were destroyed because of sin, because of willful sin. Eve thought she was right by eating. Adam knew it was wrong. He intentionally, willfully disobeyed the spoken word of God. And we are all still paying for that today. It is because of this judgment that is on those that profess to be children of God today. Thanks to Adam for eating something God told him not to eat. If that was only our case. Eating something we weren't supposed to eat. We've gone way past that. And God doesn't like it because it's a reproach to him. Having an intimate relationship with God will require you to walk in obedience to God. Having an intimate relationship with God will require you to walk in obedience to God's word. But if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there's no longer sacrifices that will cover these sins. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. Those who have experienced the good things, the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. Let me break it down. Everyone that sits in this assembly, you have been hearing the truth of the word of God. You have been experiencing the power of God's word working in your life. You have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit working on your behalf. You are being protected by the kingdom power and authority by being under this witness protection plan. To have experienced all that you have experienced here, then to turn your back on God and go into the world, God says you're going to be worse off. You've experienced it. That's what we were sharing in Bible study. You can't just brush through these things that the word of God has been spoken over you. The things that you have experienced in that word being brought to pass, that's tasting of the word of God. That's experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit working on your behalf. Being able to be protected from COVID and all these other diseases where you don't get sick. And you get healed instantly when things that come upon you, that's experiencing the kingdom of God here on earth. Because as it is in heaven, so should it be here on the earth. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. This is real. You've been experiencing this. But it's such an everyday thing, you might take it for granted. You may not even realize how blessed you are. But this is what he's saying. If you've been sitting in that type of an environment and you still go and sin willfully, ain't nothing else he got to offer. He's giving you his best. It's on you. But not only just it's on you and it passes, it sends God into revenge mode against you because he's going to get your attention. You may have to be like Nebuchadnezzar who thought that he had created all the wealth of his kingdom that thought he was the great power that thought the sun rose and sat by him. Then God decided to get his attention one day and it led him to eat grass like animal for seven years, I believe. Can you imagine seeing you or one of your friends? We in church, you look out the window, your friend is running out here in the field eating grass. 
like a cow. You won't say there's is something wrong with them. No, God is working with them. God is trying to get their attention to show him, show them, show you who's really in charge. And it said he ate for seven years out in the field. Hair grew long, nails grew long like an eagle. But it said one day while eating, he came to himself. Looked up to God and said, now I know you, God. Now I know I'm just an instrument. I ain't did nothing, ain't created nothing. It's all about you, God. God said, that's all I need to hear. Brought him back to his senses. Because he had experienced the power of God working in his life. But he tried to take credit for it. Don't you dare try to take credit for what's going on in your life because of how much money you make. Because of your connections, because of your talent and your skills and your ability, or your resources, God could dry it all up overnight to get your attention. Sometimes God has to remove things out of our life that's causing us to get distracted. And he will show us what's really important. He says that, it is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. In a lot of our disobedience, we are humiliating Jesus Christ and all that he accomplished for us. You are nailing him on the cross again, but the enemy will do all he can to get you to focus on some people some circumstance or some situation that will try to help you justify nailing Jesus to the cross. I just want to ask you one thing. Is there any justifiable reason for sending Jesus back to the cross? What could he accomplish on a second trip that he didn't accomplish on the first? You're telling him, I don't have time for that. This is how professing believers treat the blood of the covenant which makes us holy as if it were common and unholy. Insulting and showing the Holy Spirit that he is unworthy of your consideration or respect. When you're willfully sinning, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. You're telling him he's not even worth your respect. He's not even worth considering when you are making these decisions that dishonor God. Your actions reveal that you are still alienated and hostile in attitude toward God. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise. Without hope and without God in the world. Let that sink in, people. The world will try to tell you that sin is not a big deal because of what Jesus did. On the contrary, because of what Jesus did, sin became and is a big deal. It's not your focus, but you don't want to put God in revenge mode against you because he takes it personally. When you sin, God takes it personally. When people do things against you, you take it personally. Because they are going directly against you. Some of us even go to four if they do it against other people. We take it personally. Because of some kind of connection that we may have with them. Where do you think that comes from? God hates sin. Therefore, because you do these things, in your future, only thing that you have to look forward to is the fury and the revenge of God. Waiting on when he going to get it. When is he going to pay me back? Because God says in his rage and fire, he's going to consume his enemies. You, you've seen any of those fire pictures going on that go on every year in the West where the fire comes through at such a rage 
It's taking out whole neighborhoods. People are running for their lives. Sometimes the smoke even comes from the West Coast to the East Coast. That's a raging fire. It's consuming a lot of stuff. God said, when I come, I'm going to come like that. And you're going to know why it's happening when I come. Because I'm going to bring it to your remembrance. You remember when? See, that's why you need God on your side, because he'll forget that. He'll forget it. If you are seeking to walk in obedience to God, never to remember it. But if you willfully sin, he can't forget it because you haven't put yourself under the witness protection plan and in his walk so that you are in a position that he will forget it. Because you have said, I don't want the payment that you're going to make. I'm going to take care of my own stuff. And he's waiting for a payment. And he'll give you plenty of time to make the payment. And that the payment is to accept his offer of salvation, which starts with being born again, which gets you in the family and under the witness protection plan, but empowers you to move toward God, not away from God, as willfully sinning does. You see, when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. This is how we tell who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. This is why you cannot be a sinner and a born-again believer at the same time. You cannot be a sinner and a born-again believer at the same time. you either one or the other. But what does the devil try to make you believe? I'm a sinner that just fall down. And get up. And everybody likes that topic for a reason. Everybody likes to be identified as that. Especially professing believers. No, I'm just a sinner. We all make mistakes. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Those are unsaved people. That's why you need to be born again. But the enemy will allow us to take the word of God out of context. To keep us following his scheme. This is why God tells us to make our election and call and sure. If you are professing to be a child of God, you need to make sure of your election and God calling you. You got to make sure you're truly born again. What was the experience like? When did it happen? You know, it's kind of amazing being in church for so long and you see people that are in church all their life and you see the children that grow up in life. You never see an experience when it comes to I give my life to the Lord. It kind of like flows with the system. In the season when someone is getting baptized, it's like a season and everybody says, I want to give my life to the Lord. But you never really saw anything happen. And even after the decision was made, you didn't see any change take place. You saw life as usual. Mm. That's an encounter with God. When you say you're giving your life to the Lord, you are supposed to have had an encounter. An encounter that you will never forget. It will be an experience. It will mark your life. The last Friday in April, 1983, between four in the afternoon to three to four o'clock in the morning. That was an experience for me. I met others that could tell me the same stories. But I find that people that grow up in church just learn the language. They learn the protocol. They know how to act. But it's hard to see where there was truly an encounter that brought about a change. You don't see people moving toward God. Matter of fact, you see them getting more resentful of the things of God, getting more embarrassed about the things of God, not wanting to be recognized as being a part of the things of God. There's something going on. That's why we observe. Do you move closer to God once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Or does your behavior show that you're moving further away? That's not the formula for salvation. That's the formula for religion or just performing or coming for the wrong reasons. 
You're supposed to have come to a place where you've recognized who God is. And you realize who you are. And you recognize what needs to happen in your life to show God love and to be in a relationship with God. And that's supposed to be valuable enough to you that you want to make the changes to make sure you keep him happy. A lot of confession, true confession, is made in suffering. A lot of true, genuine confession of faith are made in struggling. That's why God says it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven because he knows no struggles. It's hard for those that are doing well in life. It is hard for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven because they have no struggle. They have no drive for they want life to change. They just be only become more self-centered and want more stuff to stay happy, to stay entertained. These are the things that I've been observing over this soon to be 40 years. There's no love for God. In a relationship, there has to be love. There has to be a commitment to want to please the object of your love. You can't be shamed to talk about your love if you're really in love. You're not ashamed to talk about when you're in lust, trying to make it look like love. You can't say you love someone else and don't love God. You just can't because God is love. And we love because he first loved us. To let us know, you don't know what love looked like until you look at me. And you're not walking in love until you're willing to love like I love. This thing that we call love is nothing but lust, and that's an affront to God. God hates that because that's Satan's way. That's Satan's way to pretend he loves. But he only wants the stuff. He only wants what's in it for him. God said, I'm going to take revenge on everybody that's trying to approach me like that. As if I don't know what's going on. Forget people. <laughs> you got to know that God knows, regardless of what you think you can hide, God knows the truth about you. You can't fake love with God. You don't, know what, you don't know love enough to fake it. Because the minute you need to show love is when you're ready to jump ship when things get tough. Therefore, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in him because we are under the ministry of Jesus Christ. Which brings us to our third principle as we learn more about the ministry of Jesus Christ. The ministry of Jesus Christ holds you accountable for sinning. The ministry of Jesus Christ holds you accountable for sinning where the enemy wants you to think that God Winks his eye at sin. It no longer matters. No, God's not holding your sins against you, but he's also empowered you so that you don't have to sin. And when you willfully sin, you are sinning directly against God who takes it personally. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Isn't that right, Joy? Isn't that right? I did not mean the immoral people of this world or greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or a sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, verbally abusive, a drunkard, a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outside. God takes this sin so personally. He tells all of his children, 
If you know anybody professing to be a child of God and they're walking in these sins, don't associate with them, don't even eat with them. Let that marinate. Do you understand what he just said? If you know somebody that's professing to be a brother or sister in Christ and you know they're sexually immoral, you know they're liars, you know they're greedy, you know they're swindlers and idolaters, and the list goes on. If you know somebody that's like that, don't associate. You know what associate means? It means have nothing to do with. Why would God say such a thing? Like we said, I ain't playing. You think I'm playing? Well, let me catch you eating with one. When I sit in the fire, you be sitting at the table with them, you can get seriously burned too. Because I want you to remember. You don't play with me. Do I look like your eagle or something? I told you what I told you, and that's what I mean. He said, look, for what business is this? Remove the evil person from among you. He said, remove them. Get them out your life. Who loved God that much? Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Somebody ragging your husband or your wife or your parents down every time you see them. You go, oh, yeah, let's go out to lunch. Depends on where you are with them, right? You might need to hear that because you feel the same way because you think that, that ain't good. God said, listen, you represent me here on this earth. And people need to know how I feel about sin, especially those who profess to be my children. If you know they're you know they doing any of these things, you hear what he's saying now? If you know they're doing it, this is what I want you to do. Guess what happens if you don't do it? Now you being willfully disobedient. You are now willfully sinning. Oh, my God, why would he put me in such a situation? This is how I find out who my children are. This is how I find out who really loved me. This is where I find out who's willing to put me first and sacrifice. Because I told you, whether it's mama, daddy, husband, wife, children, daughter, brothers, I told you in the beginning, if you're not willing to forsake them, you can't be my disciple. Why would they treat you that way? You claim to love God. And you acting like this. And you know what he done told me I had to do once I find out this. So it, it, that's all it means to you? Okay, I can cut you loose. You don't care about me knowing the situation that you're going to put me in. That's like going, robbing a bank, and coming running to my house, asking me, can I protect you? And if you're foolish enough to do it, guess what? You are now harboring a criminal. Guess where you're going? To jail. As an accessory. Let it sink in because you got to see this picture. Isn't God, isn't God, see how wise he is? Because sometimes we got a neck to just look at folks sinning and kind of talk about them. But, you know, we ain't really willing to cut them loose. We still hang out with them. Oh, my God. Remove the evil person from among you. Because if you stand around them, you ain't following my instructions. Lord have mercy. Why would God do such a thing? We look like everybody we know that profess to be children of God living in sin. They don't have to. They choose to. People choose to treat you wrong. People choose not to respect you. Let it be what it is. You got to choose. Doesn't that make your mind go to work? You see the pictures going through your head now, don't you? Oh, my God. Mm. Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males. No thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Not only are we told to hang out with these people, we now have to 
give them a whole new name that we talked about. They don't have to be who God created them to be. They can be whatever they choose. If they want to be a great, you got to call them a great. And you will be punished if you don't. Wow. If there was only such boldness in the kingdom of heaven, if there was only such boldness in the kingdom of heaven, if you cannot be who God has created you to be, there is no need or use for you in my world. That's the way I feel. Thank God I'm living in your world. I can adjust. I will adjust. But under no circumstances would I allow anything or anyone to allow me or lead me to violate my love for God because it's hard enough honoring that love just by the natural way of things. Now you're going to throw all this other stuff on the top of the cake and now I got to deal with that too? That's, I ain't going to mess with that. Let's just take that off the table. That ain't necessary. Nowhere. And if that's what you want to do, fine. That's your world, fine. It cannot be a part of my world. That's my choice. Just like you can honor yours, I can honor mine. But I'm not going to try to force mine on you. If you don't want mine, I'm just going to move on. I'm not going to make you honor mine. And if my association with you out here in the world requires me to have to honor these things, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to just step away from it. I don't need it that bad because my God is my provider. He will take care of me, and he obviously wants me to meet him at a place like this. When the world and those that don't truly, are not truly committed to God have not gotten to know their God for who he really is and what he can do in their lives. Do not be deceived. They will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And don't get me wrong. Yes, yeah, some of us used to be like that. We all used to be like this in some form or fashion. But through Jesus Christ, we were washed. We were cleansed. And we were delivered from that way of life. We were sanctified. And we were justified by God. Because he saw that it was a fit payment for us in becoming into a relationship with God. And because of that payment and because of what God has done, we are supposed to throw off the old sinful nature and our former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, we are to let the Spirit renew our thoughts and attitudes, put on a new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. This is our mission. This is who we are not to please the world. If you do this, it says the world is going to hate you. And see how subtle the enemy is? Most professing believers have been coasting through because the world hadn't had that many challenges that you had to deal with on a regular basis, right? Now he's bringing it on your job, especially in the school systems, where you got to follow all these new rules and do all these new things you got to let people be whoever they want to be, but you can't not once try to stand on your own belief because now you consider it what they call it uh, intolerant. <laughs> yes, I quite, I am very intolerant. I'm learning how to be intolerant and stay righteous. <laughs> Are you hearing me? If we only had such boldness in the kingdom of heaven, you all are being intolerant of my relationship and my walk with God. You're constantly throwing things in me that are challenging my walk with God. That's very intolerant of you. That's very incompassionate of you. That is very unthoughtful of you to not even consider how these things are going to impact me and who I profess to be. You act like you don't even care. You've basically said you don't care. So why must I care about the things that God don't care about? If that's who I believe. It comes with a price. You can, but it comes with a price. And unfortunately, if you haven't come to know God like that, you can't see being able to pay that price and still succeed. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all parts of the same body 
and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we don't have an obligation to the flesh. Hear me. As children of God, you have no obligation to the flesh, whether it be yours or someone else's. You have no obligation to it. I have no obligation to the sin that Satan is leashing in the world through other people's flesh. I have no obligation to it whatsoever. You as a child of God have no obligation to it whatsoever. But I must warn you, you need to be in a real intimate relationship to God to make such a stand. Or you may just be, you have to be willing to die or suffer whatever you need to suffer to realize that this is the stand I have to make today. Even though my faith is not strong enough without wondering what happened, I'm going to make the stand anyway because I got to start somewhere. Don't you allow anyone to make you believe that you have an obligation to the human nature, whether it be yours or someone else's. That's in Romans chapter 8. You need to read that entire chapter. As a born-again child of God, under the ministry of Jesus Christ, you have no obligation to please or satisfy the flesh of the human nature, yours or no one else's. If you do, you are directly, willfully sinning against the word of God. I say that in the context when this human nature's effort is to lead you to be disobedient to your faithfulness to God. You have no obligation to the human nature in any form, shape, or fashion if you profess to be a child of God. To do so, you will be willfully sinning against the knowledge that you have of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and your God. Therefore, if through the power of the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires, and the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your go good intentions by your own power. See, God is moving us from that complacent relationship. He's bringing sin closer and closer to your front door. He's bringing it right and dropping it in your lap. Now you got to make a decision. And he's bringing it in places that are considered valuable or dear to you or necessary. But you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to stand for who you say you are. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law 
of Moses. Now, of course, you're free to do whatever you want to do. You're free to do whatever you want to do. But you must understand that just because you're free to do it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be beneficial if your desire is to have this intimate relationship with God that allows you to enjoy the quality of life that Jesus came, died, and rose again for us to have. Therefore, you must not be mastered by anything, whether it's your job, your career, your possessions, your finances, your reputation. You can't be possessed by any of those things because whatever you allow to master you, you are its slave. Whatever you allow to master you, you are its slave. The body is for the Lord. He must be your master if you wish to inherit God's kingdom. Your bodies are a part of Christ's body, the very temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you whom you have from God. Your body is not your own. You have been bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. If you profess to be under the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verses 39, 32 through 39, the believers are told to think back to those early days when they first gave their life to the Lord, to remember how they remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. That's why I said early, God says when you come to know him for the first time, there's supposed to be an experience that you're supposed to be able to look back on and remember. The average person can't remember the day they were born, born again. There's something inherently wrong about that. I won't say what it is, because I'm not whoever you are. But throughout scriptures, God tells us to remember the journey. Remember when you first came in, because he says when you came in, you were enthusiastic. You were excited. You were on fire to serve the Lord and to do the things that pleased God. He said, not only that, when you came in, you were willing to suffer with others. You were willing to be okay with the conversation of your property and the things that you owned before. And that you were willing to help others while they were suffering. That's that enthusiasm when you come into the Lord. He said, that's supposed to be an event. That's supposed to be an assign when you first give your life to the Lord. It's an exciting time. It's a time where you are truly committed to God 100%. You're all about whatever it is you're supposed to be about, and he's right there working with you as you are sacrificing whatever you need to sacrifice for those who are going through the same sufferings as you are doing. What happened? What happened? He says sometimes they were exposed to public ridicule and were beating. Sometimes they helped others who were suffering the same thing. They suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all they owned was taken from them, they accepted it with joy. They knew there were better things waiting for them that would last forever. You have to understand that the purpose of our walk with God is to reveal what's truly in our heart. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it starts a journey. Things start to unfold. And it's to reveal what's truly in your heart. Whether you love God and whether you trust him or not. During this process, God will cause things to happen that will humble you. Since you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, are you becoming humble or are you becoming more prideful? more resentful, more self-centered, more eager to show everybody else's weaknesses to prove that they ain't all that. It's, it's your journey. It's revealing the truth about you and your confession. That's what it reveals. God allowed it to happen that way. Because we need to know that there's nothing good within us, our human nature, our flesh. Nothing but sin. And it's the spirit man created in the image and likeness of Jesus. It's who Jesus came to set free. 
to free him to take over this mind, this body, and this desire for the world to serve and seek the true and living God. He allowed you to be humble to test your character, to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbles you by letting you go hungry, letting you struggle, not allowing you to get some of the things that you want to get in life, making you feel that you are missing something, to let you know that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, every word that's written in this book, that if you've truly been born again, you are excited about hearing. You're excited about applying it to your life. You're excited about the opportunity to test it, to see whether it really does what it says it will do. You, you hunger for it like the babies hunger the milk, like clockwork. You're thinking about it. But what is it really re revealing about you since you gave your life to the Lord? Remember, it's your walk. It's your portrait. It's your story. It's no one else. Sure, you may have thought it was a Rembrandt. I thought it was just some paint dropped on the paper by accident. What picture are you painting? Because people are supposed to see, according to God, that you've made a change. You see, Jesus came to challenge your ideas. Jesus came to challenge your belief systems. That's why he was such a problem when he showed up. Those that thought they knew, thought they were in the know, he challenged their belief system. That's why they had such a problem with it. That's why so many people are having such a problem with Jesus Christ, such a problem with the word of God, because it challenges their belief system. It challenges their way of thinking that they have developed. It challenges their processes. It challenges their entire state of being and their confidence in themselves. Jesus' first word in public ministry was repent. Repent is not an attack on your spirit. It is an attack on your mind. The word repent means change the way you have been conditioned to think. Change your mind. Repentance attack on your mind, your philosophy, your belief system. See, this is very important. You have to change this because God is seeking to bring you into a good place, a land of abundant living. God's plan for you is to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. We are told that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, and evil people and impostors will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But we must remain faithful to the things we have been taught because we know they are true because we can trust those who teach us. Do you trust your teaching? That's what it boils down to. Do I really trust what I'm learning? You see, we must remain faithful to the things we have been taught. Because professing believers must take this word to heart because you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood for your faith. We don't know what's down the road. But we know that we are in an environment that is constantly growing more hostile becoming more evil, promoting more things that totally go against the word of God. That's what's brewing now. I don't think it's no coincidence that we are about to be presented to the world. Because God says, everyone who seeks to live righteously in this life will suffer persecution. Because it is for discipline that you must endure it. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? 
But if you are without discipline, which is what the call of God is all about, to start a consistent walk of discipline. If you're not in discipline, of which we all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. This brings us to our fourth principle as we learn more about the ministry of Jesus. It requires you to endure suffering and stay obedient to God. The ministry of Jesus Christ requires you to endure suffering in obedience to God. You must be obedient through your suffering, through your trials, through your tribulations. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 19. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Do not repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with assaults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scripture says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So, you got to stay focused. Don't throw away your confidence. You must stay firm in the Lord. Remember the promise, the great reward that he's promised us if we stand faithful to his word. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Therefore, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For we know that when our faith is tested, our endurance has a chance to grow. So we let it grow. Because when endurance is fully developed, we will be perf perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptation you are in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. Imagine that. Regardless of what you encounter, God says, I prepared you to handle it, to stand under it. And he's going to provide a way for you to escape because he wants you to endure it. Therefore, if we truly are children of God, we must work hard to show the results of our salvation, people. If we are truly children of God, we must work hard to show our salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in us giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God is working in us to give us the desire and the power. 
We just have to love him to want it to happen. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lives, bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. When God calls us to become his children, he's calling us to turn our backs on lives as we know it. He's calling us to change the way we live. See, this new life is not about what we accomplish. It's not about our possessions. It's about what do we come? Who are we becoming? Who are you truly becoming as a professing believer of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Who are you becoming? God's purpose is to transform you into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If that be the case, if that's what your pursuit is, you must no longer devote yourself to pleasing your human nature in your pursuit to enjoy peace, happiness, and the abundant life. God takes sin personally. God is a vindictive God. He's a vengeful God. And he's sworn to take revenge on anyone that professes to be his children that are walking in willful sin. That's not a threat. That's a truth. That's a promise. It's happening all around us. Professing believers who have chosen to live sinful lives, God has been taking his revenge. Shaking the very foundation of this world, whether you are a born-again believer or a sinner, he's shaking everything that man has put his faith and trust in. And he's revealing that it's powerless to deliver you when God takes his revenge. He takes it on whom he chooses. And he told us whom he chooses. If you find yourself walking in willful sin, be warned, God is not slack according to his promises. He will avenge, but there's never too late, it's never too late to ward off his revenge. All it takes is repentance. Faith in what Jesus Christ did for us through his death, burial, and resurrection, paying the price for sin, putting you in a position where you now have power over sin. Sin has no authority over you. The only authority that sin has in your life is what your human nature has given it and who you as a spirit being have even chosen not to follow the word of truth, which is not possible, or he hasn't been put in a position to be free by sitting under the word of righteousness. The only way to discern what's of God and what's not. The only way to walk in the power and authority of God is in righteousness. Because that's the only thing that the Holy Spirit will empower and bring to pass in your life. Meditate on these things. God is a vengeful God. Forget people. God knows everything. Search your heart. Make sure your salvation is real. If it ain't real, it ain't nothing to be ashamed of. It's an opportunity to make it so. Because God don't play. And don't let anyone distract you about what's going on in this world. This is the movement of God. God is the only one that gives life and can take life. I'm going to ask the young men to come forward as we get ready to celebrate this awesome event that's put us in a power, in a position to walk in obedience with God, to walk in authority with God, to put ourselves in a position where we don't have to be concerned about God's revenge or his wrath. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. Praise God.